Hello, welcome to the 52nd episode of the Online Tennis Podcast. After many technical difficulties, I am joined by Owen. Thank you, Owen, for your patience and your time. How are you after all that waiting? Not a problem. Uh, I'm great. Good to be here. Good. Good. I am sure he's not lying. I think uh, I've <laughs> tested his patience for long enough, so hopefully we can actually get the show on the road. We are today looking at the first week of Wimbledon, our favourite matches, the biggest shocks so far, the best matches so far, looking ahead, looking at the quarters, maybe making some predictions, stuff like that, basically. First place I'd like to start on is with our favourite matches. We've been over it once. We'll go over it again just for the viewers at home. Sounds My right. favourite match so far, Owen, was... Andy losing to John Isner. It sounds like a shock, but I went to Wimbledon last week and I was very fortunate to meet Scott Barkley. Owen knows Scott Barkley very well. His generosity knows no bounds. He gave me centre court tickets out of the blue to see Andy. It was amazing. I don't care that he lost. It was an incredible experience. Being there and seeing it, I was screaming, come on, Andy. My voice was lost. My head really hurt by the end of it. It was, it was worth it, even though Andy, you know, it was devastating at the end. Fine, I was a little bit zombified, but to see it. And also you get a very good appreciation for, for Isner's serve and just how good it was. 130 miles an hour out wide consistently is very difficult to land, even for John Isner. So I could kind of appreciate the loss and just say too good because it could happen to anybody, to be honest. How did you feel watching it from uh, home? Yeah, I, I was frustrated. I'm not the biggest Isner fan. I find some of his political beliefs a little too much to get around um and it was tough because he was playing so well you know serve on point but he was also volleying really well and his ground strokes held up pretty well so there wasn't a lot that Murray could do and it just sort of felt like a death march to the finish line towards the end um and matches like that can be a little tough but you know all things considered I don't think Murray needs to be too disappointed with his performance he I mean I think pulling back a set on its own is pretty impressive against that version of Isner so yeah, I, I pretty much believe that Isner was peaking in that match. And I'm not just talking rubbish. I, I, I swear that's about as good as I've seen him play. Obviously, I think it's yeah. the second time I've seen him play live. The first time was at the Davis Cup and they ran rings around him. Basically, he was never going to lose that match. There, it kind of looked like he was never going to win that match, Andy, from what I saw. Yeah, I mean, it was ominous when he went down the break in the first set. And then when he lost the second set tie break, a lot of air went out of the match for me. When he pulled back the third, I had a bit of hope at the start of the fourth, but then as soon as he got broken in the fourth, that was it. There was not getting the break back after that. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Scott, if you're listening. Very, very, very much appreciated. I look forward to seeing you at some other point, and I'll give you a big, massive hug again. I actually saw Scott afterwards, Owen. I'm sure you read the article already, but um, yeah. I saw him afterwards. I could barely put a sentence together. I was completely zombified. He does know that that's the case, but I would like to say sorry for that again. Uh, Scott. I did say thanks. I think I made a pretty good account of myself just trying to be human, but my brain was completely gone at that point. I was, I was, I was completely dead. I, I know how you feel. I mean, um, I, I was at the Nadal Djokovic match at Roland Garros, and even though I didn't have like a huge rooting interest in that going in, it was so intense that when I came out, it felt like I had a crater in my head. Um, it was one in the morning. I was exhausted. Couldn't have had a conversation with anyone. So Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know exactly exactly how I feel then. And have you had a favorite match so far? One? Yeah, I think um, I have a couple. I think um, Serena's comeback match in singles against Harmony Tan in the first round was a lot of fun, even though she ended up losing. Um, had a lot of um, really fun all court rallies. It was it felt like pretty like a pretty epic struggle of a match. Um, almost three hours, I think, super tie break at the end. Um, and we had a lot of vintage Serena moments with the return winners and the sharp angled winners from the baseline um and so even though she didn't come through it in the end um i thought it was a lot of fun i thought tan really deserved a victory um and i was glad that match happened and then um yesterday i actually had a lot of fun watching um tim van reithoven play Djokovic. um yeah mm-hmm. he, he went on an insane serving tear at the end of the second set and you know Djokovic demolished him after that as he does um but there were a few minutes there i was like yeah this um this guy is fun to watch so i enjoyed that as well yeah, he's got an incredible peak to his game, especially on grass, yeah. obviously. But yeah, there's parts of that match that were amazing. I think that was Djokovic's first proper challenge. I know uh, Quam was tough in the first round, but I would Yeah, but argue, this was very different. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I would argue Djokovic won his best in that match, and I thought he really had to play his best to, to beat uh, Tim yesterday. So yeah, it's, a, it's a, different, a different matter for sure. And we'll get a bit more onto that later. I, I was going to talk a little bit about some of the shocks that have happened so far on. So probably, obviously, in fact, the biggest shock of the tournament so far would be Schwantek losing to... 
Ali the Corny, I would say, in the third round. Did you expect that at all? No, um, but I think, I, I mean, her level had not been great at Wimbledon. Like, I think she was the favorite in every match she played just because, like, she's become a world beater. She's winning every match. Her level mm-hmm. is way higher than everyone else's. Um, but I think at the same time, it kind of felt like she was going to lose during Wimbledon after a match or two just because her game wasn't translating as well on grass as it had on the other surfaces. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't think that reflects badly on her at all. I mean, I think many other players would have burned out by now or had a terrible match or not been able to close one out. And I mean, to get through 37 matches is astonishing. Um, mm-hmm. And grass is, you know, the most niche surface on tour by now. So I think if it was going down anywhere, it was here. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I think she understands that as well. Like, I think she had a quote that said something like, even in practice, I wasn't really feeling it, so yeah. I, I can't really be surprised. Um, so I don't want to use the word ideal, but it does kind of feel like a fitting way for the streak to end, I guess. Yeah, definitely, yeah. I think I, I released an article today sort of on a, a, an analysis of the, the match, but particularly just on Schwantek's game on grass courts in general, I think the two biggest takeaways, certainly in this match, were Schwantek's movement one on a on a grass court in general just not being able to slide feeling like she should be able to slide but really you can't slide on a grass court reliably i would say for for every shot especially if you're looking to defend sliding every time like it's it's not i i've seen people i think Djokovic is a really good slider to be fair i suppose it is doable he's he's the best but he's kind of the only one i mean yannick center has been doing it a little bit but no one else doesn't um that i've seen anyway yeah, from what I've seen of Shontek when she was sliding, it almost was like she was losing her footing every single time she tried it. I don't really know what the ins and outs of that are. I don't know why Djokovic can do it. I don't know why Shontek can't do it, but mm-hmm. she couldn't do it. And it, it was it clearly made her defensive to offensive game far worse than it, than it normally is. And that's normally like one of the reasons that nobody can figure out how to beat Shontek. So without that, she was a little bit um, lost, definitely. And she did talk about the fact that she didn't know how to play tactically after the match. And one of the yeah. other massive things, Corny was able to attack Schwantek's second serve really reliably, basically kick serve on grass is attackable. It's, you know, you, you can put kick on the ball, it's not going to act, act completely volatilely on a, a grass court surface compared to a clay court surface. Even a hard court surface, it bounces pretty high, whereas it's not going to have as much elevation on a grass court. And Corny was stepping into the, the second serve and attacking as she should have done as any sort of top 20 returner I would say should be able to do and really put Schwantek under pressure over and over again so really actually seeing the matchup transpire like that you could you know Corny kind of looked like the better player by a mile yeah yeah I agree I think um an astonishing thing really is that Schwantek can still improve like I think the serve can and will get better um I think she will figure out the sliding on grass because she did it a little bit and her her movement's so good on the other surfaces. I feel like within a few years, she'll get more matches. She'll figure that out as well. Um, like she may not be in her final form yet, which is kind of crazy because she just won thirty seven matches in a row. Um, so yeah. I can't wait to see what the next chapter looks like for her. Yeah, I, I remember seeing like halfway through the season, after one of her wins, um, she said there's stuff she could still improve in her game. She she recognizes that, and she didn't go into exactly what she could improve. So she didn't give away tips and tricks for her opponents basically but i'm yeah. sure that's one of, that will be one of the biggest things she's referring to her serve her second serve is like she's got the best second serve points one percentage on the tour but if if a i mean that's only because people can't attack it so it's it's, just, yeah. it's a it's not a, it's a neutralizing shot and as soon as it goes back to a, a ground stroke of shown you know the advantage is back in her court which is why she has a percentage over 50 percent on second serve yeah i, I feel like I feel like that stat can sometimes be a, mi- a bit misleading because um, it doesn't necessarily mean her second serve in isolation is the best on tour. Um, mm. I-, I think part of it is that when her ground strokes get involved, she takes over because her ground strokes are among the best on tour. Um, but I think a- as an individual shot, her second serve can definitely get better. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah well, I-, I definitely agree with that. So yeah, her crashing out, maybe not the craziest thing in the world, but yeah, certainly, you know, I'm- I think for most people, most people would cons- consider it the biggest upset of the tournament so far, I would say. For sure. Next biggest upset, Christian Garin into the quarters after Berrettini's withdrawal. Did you see yeah, we were we were talking about this. I um, I will admit, like, so I haven't seen a ton of Garin, but when I watch him play, I, I don't see a top player there. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so, I, and so, I watched part of his match against Demonor, and I was like, 
what are these big forehands? Like, where is this going from? Um, you know, I've, I think I watched a match of his at the ATP Cup against Batista Agut, and he just got absolutely flattened. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, he's had some struggles this year. And even though his ranking had gotten into the top 20, I never really understood why. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, I'm, I'm very happy for him. Like, four matches in a row on grass is hard. Like, a lot of other players, higher ranks players, are not doing what he's doing. Um, I think his... He's got a quarterfinal with Kyrgios now, right? Yeah. I mean, like, he may lose that, but that's also winnable. I mean, yeah. you never know what version of Nick is going to show up. So, yeah, um, yeah, Green's been great. But, yeah, definitely surprising. Made the most of that Berrettini withdrawal, for sure. Mm. He's a fascinating player, actually, I find. Um, because, as you say, you don't really know why he's in the top 20. And, and actually, a lot of his points are predictably from the Golden Swing. It's not a... You know, that's not a... a um, an urban myth, I guess, whatever you want to call it. Like he, he, that is the case. Like he does, he does use a lot of the points from the golden swing. I don't think he, that's still an achievement in itself. Whatever, it's not like he's vulturing that, you know, that uh, portion of the tour. But oh yeah, I mean, points are points. Like however you yeah. can get them, like doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But yeah, it's no secret he's had a pretty rough uh, season so far. You're quite right. So yeah, for him to come into the to Wimbledon, make the quarters, it, it's like his backhand. I really, I, I mean, I, it's not why he's good on clay. To be fair, and I think it, it's like people say oh he's got a flat backhand it's bizarre that he's good on clay it's not the reason he's good on clay like, he's amazing at moving he's got a really good forehand that's basically the two things that make him accept it is that the movement and the retrieval skills are exceptional at times they're so good yeah. which is kind of you know it translates to most surfaces but that backhand should be good on grass like so yeah he's, he's quite a he's a he is a fascinating player i really think he is um so yeah okay it's an upset for him to get to the quarters but he deserved a big result at some point, I think. He's oh, been plugging sure. away. The guy's had such a bad season. I felt really bad for him in his post-match interview. He looked absolutely exhausted talking about the hard work he's put in. So Yeah. Um, yeah I, I, I'm, I'm happy to see him there, Owen, in some ways. Yeah, me too. Um, another guy I'm happy to see doing well is uh, David Goffin, just because historically yeah. he's had terrible luck. So when he like also got through a really tough five-setter in the fourth round against uh, Francis Tiafo, he's another like feel-good player. Um, like you're just happy for him, you know. It's like, yeah, yeah, like I'm, I'm glad to see you there. And um, I don't know who he plays in the quarters this time, but I do know it's not Djokovic who he had in the quarters the last time he went that far at Wimbledon. Um, so I'm happy mm-hmm. for him there because it means he has a shot at winning it as well. I know he, he plays Cam Nori. Yeah, like that's again, like maybe not the favorite, but also like can absolutely win that match. So he could, it's, he it's could a good win. place to be. We'll get onto it properly in a bit, but yeah, you're quite right. It's a good place to be. Um, as far as big shots go, just to round this part off, Jule Nymer, Jack, oh, I can't say the name, Jule Nymer, I think, Nymer, maybe, um, facing Tatiana Maria in the quarters. The two of those players getting through, obviously, massive upsets. Tatiana Maria has never made it to the quarters of a slam before, and at 37, I don't have it in front of me, actually. She's pretty old anyway, mid-30s, um, as a mother of two, I believe. It's a pretty crazy upset for her to, to be making her first quarter this late in her life. It's, it's crazy, actually. But Wimbledon, if, if it was going to be any slam, I would say Wimbledon was the one. Obviously, slices on both wings most of the time is pretty much a, a, a rhythm breaker of, of a player. You know, kind of got into Sakari's head in the third round. Ostapenko's as well. You know, the two of them able to smack the ball, but she was um, just able to sort of suck the life out of them, basically. Which is yeah. not a not a slight honor at all. <laughs> Saved match points against Ostapenko as well, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I I didn't see those matches, but I mean, wins against Sakari and Ostapenko, that's no joke. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, it's um, I love how more recently in tennis, like players are achieving things as they get older, and like not mm-hmm. achieving like lesser things or the same things, but like getting personal best results towards the yeah. back half of their career. I mean, that just shows really amazing levels of persevere perseverance because the tour is a grind so yeah um mm-hmm. all the props to her yeah yeah definitely yeah that's um corny as well obviously is, is it falls yeah. into that category too oh, almost um, made a, a second quarter final in a row at a major after not making one ever or only making one in her previous years yeah yeah <coughs> yeah it's mad <coughs> pardon me on covid um yeah and uh, nightmare uh, if people have been watching her, they might not consider this a massive upset because she hits a massive ball. She hits the ball bigger than 95% of the tour. She, she's an incredibly good hitter. It's just been sort of putting it together and 
yeah, she she has matches where she's all over the place, but I think that's just an age thing. And when she does sort of grow into her game properly, which could be right now, she's going to be incredibly dangerous. She defeated Annette Conte in the second round, not the biggest upset in the world, to be fair, but um, the emphatic fashion in which she did it, six four six love was pretty telling and definitely got people to start looking, uh, taking note of her. Definitely, so I, I, I mean, she'll be the favourite for this. If there was a player that was going to mess with her rhythm, it would be Maria. Um, but if she has truly arrived, then I think it'll be the, the German to get through for sure. It'll be interesting to see her in the semis. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, you touched on Serena Williams, so we will move past that. Although, yeah, I was saying beforehand, maybe not a massive shock. I actually thought Harmony Tam was one of the best players for playing Serena in her current yeah. form in that she, she can move Serena about better than quite a lot of other players. Yeah, um, the, the Body Surf podcast had a nice segment on this. Um, they said, like, if... Serena had come up against a power player. They thought she would have won, um, yeah. because she like wouldn't have had to move as much. Um, I actually thought she moved quite well, but like those rallies for three hours, like first match back, that's not easy. Like and and you know you can't fake your way through that. And she was very close to winning. You know, surfed for it five four thirty fifteen, and then was up four zero in the tiebreak. Um, so she got super close. And I actually thought um. After she seemed pretty okay with it, like I think she was more yeah. encouraged with her level than she was disappointed about the result, which is great. Um, because I'd love for her to keep playing. Yeah, yeah, I agree on definitely. I'm a massive Serena fan, so fingers crossed. Um, yeah, moving on to a few of the other best matches so far, and a little bit of stuff to talk about. Well, certainly one that's got loads to talk about, but I'm um, we'll start with Alcaraz and Sinner, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. yeah, that was one. That's been one of my favorite matches so far. I thought the level on that was incredible, and, and generally the rivalry just it gets me really excited. I think it's probably my favorite rivalry to be um, of all the possible rivalries. It's, it's incredible. The two of them are so mature. The two of them hit the ball so well, and I, I think they probably are going to start bringing the best out of each other for sure. Yeah, I I would love to see that. I mean, I think the most remarkable thing is that their games are complete already, um, even though they're you know, 19 and 20. Um, I think center is 20. Um, like, yes, there yeah. are certain things can get better, but there is not a whole lot that's problematic, um, which is huge. Um, and mm-hmm. uh, on the quality of the match, it's funny. Like, I, I agree that it was really fun, but I thought the first two sets, um, Sinner basically peaked. He was astonishingly good, but I, I really didn't think Alcaraz showed up until mm-hmm. 60 or 70% of the way through the match. Like, um, I, I don't know if he was ever really at his best. I mean, I think he played a few awesome points in the tiebreak to avoid going down in straights because he was close. Um, mm-hmm. But, like, even in the fourth, um, I mean, he almost lost it and probably should have lost it 6-2. Um, it never really felt like a super even fight to me. I thought Sinner was consistently outclassing him. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was tight, to be fair. There was, tight, there was tight games at the start of the fourth set, I thought. And, yes, yes. Um, I think if you were ever rooting against Alcaraz, you'd constantly be scared because... yeah. Like he is, he's um, the, the stat you were saying about straight sets there, like it was close to being straight sets. He's not gone down in straight sets this year. Like every all of his five losses have been, um, I think they've they've not went well. They've not went to a decider necessarily. But he's won at least a set in, in all five of them, and he, he showed why. Like he, the fight he showed in the third set, and, and like kind yeah. of carried it into the fourth for just a bit before Sinner was able to kind of like eradicate some break points. It's terrifying. Like he's such a good player. Yeah, I mean, um, and. Uh... The, th- the things he does on match points, like, I know people don't like the big three comparisons, but, like, it's Djokovic-like. Like, in, in that tiebreak, down match point, Sinner hits a backhand cross court that hits the sideline and the baseline. Alcaraz gets it back, goes on to win the point. Yeah. Eight all in the tiebreak, hits a, an obscene half volley winner. Um, yeah. And then he saves, like, three more match points uh, in the fourth set. Like, it's scary. You have to put him away. Um, yeah. I-, I would hate to root against him, um, but I like yeah. him, so everything's good. Um, yeah, exactly. Same. I, but there yeah. will come a time where somebody I like just a little bit more is playing him, and, and I'm not going to enjoy the experience at all. Oh yeah. I mean, the one thing I'll say about him, and you know, he's so young that I don't think this is worrying in the slightest. Is um, I, like most of his worst performances this year have been at the majors. Um, like the Australian Open against Berrettini, he almost came back, but he kind of spotted Berrettini the first two sets, or at least the first set. Um, I think a similar thing happened against Zverev at Roland Garros. I think a similar thing happened here. Like, in the first two sets, there was one guy on the court. Um, and considering, you know, the heights Alcaraz is capable of achieving and the heights we've seen from him this year, 
for that to be happening in the majors of all places, it's just not great. Um, I, yeah. I assume it'll change eventually. Pressure is higher at the majors. He could reverse that trend at the U.S. Open, but not super ideal. Oh, I'll, I'm sure it'll change. Definitely it'll change at some point. But yeah, you're quite right. Like All three slams so far, he's dropped to the opening two sets and then turned the match into something a little bit um, more, well, a lot more competitive. Because um, even the one against Zverev was down to the wire, definitely in that four set tie break, he was playing phenomenally well and it took a very, yeah. very high level to put him away. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, you're quite right. I I, I absolutely love him. I love Sinner as well. Do, do you rate Sinner's chances at all against Djokovic in the next round? No. Um, I think, I mean, his form is great, but I think it's just such a different matchup. Like, it's, I think it's one thing to watch him serve Alcaraz off the court, but I have a feeling that, you know, he'll first service game against Djokovic. Djokovic is going to make a few good returns, mm-hmm. and Sinner's life is just going to be hell immediately on serve. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that's just what he does. He'll make him hit every shot on the run, so he's not going to be able to stand there and blast away. I mean, he'll do damage for sure because he's good enough. Um, he could take a set, but yeah, I don't see him winning. Uh, what do you think? Um, yeah, I, I definitely agree. I, I could see him taking the set for sure, but there's, it's like I think Alcaraz let him off with a lot of second serves um, mm-hmm. in that match, and this just doesn't happen against Djokovic yeah. at all. Um, yeah. And there's there's ways that Djokovic will outfox Sinner that he's not maybe not even experienced on the grass court. Like um, I think from having seen Djokovic quite recently live on a grass court, it's very easy to forget how easily he can keep the ball low in the court. It, it makes yeah. his life, like, it makes the opponent's life hell on a grass court. And I think for somebody like Sinner, that could be, yeah, it could be a total just a game changer. Um, yeah. And it, yeah, it's a really, really bad matchup for him, I think. Yeah, I mean, something I wish we would talk about more in tennis, um, and to be clear, I don't think Djokovic Sinner is an example of this, but I wish we would kind of be more honest about when a player has no chance to win a match. Um, like I think, um, like Djokovic Schwartzman at Roland Garros is an example I like to bring up because before that match, some people were saying like, "Oh, popcorn match!" Like, you know, I think Schwartzman could make this really interesting, and he could barely win games. Um, and it's like, guys, this isn't a revelation. Like, he doesn't do anything as well as Djokovic. Um, you know, Ketsmanovic at Wimbledon in the third round, people are saying like, "Oh, it'll be tight. He can take a set. Could barely win games." Um. And, you know, that, that I think was harder to tell going in because Ketsmanovic had, had a great year, pushed Djokovic at the Serbian Open. Um, I think there are certain matches where you can say, like, yeah, the, the underdog has no chance here. Um, and people are saying, like, oh, you know, like, Nadal might get upset in the early rounds of Wimbledon. And it's like, no, it's not going to happen. Like, his off days mean he wins in four sets instead of three sets. Like, same thing goes for Djokovic. Um, I feel like at this point we should understand that about those guys. Yeah. Um, actually, I missed the the matchup disparity between Schwartzman and Djokovic kind of going into it, and I was like, "Oh, this could be really tight." Um, but yeah, you were correct, quite right. Like everything was very obvious. Actually, seeing it play out, um, Schwartzman was completely annihilated. Yeah. And likewise for this match, I have said that Djokovic is likely to win it, but I, I don't know if it falls into that category. Or, like, I, no, I, I, I agree. Yeah, Sinner's got a better chance than that. Yeah, I think I think Sinner Sinner's peak is. Um, but I don't even know if we've properly seen it yet. I think like center peaking properly would be terrifying because he really has so much power on both wings and and the way he returned as well. Like he returned reliably against Alcaraz. If he returns well enough, like he's got a chance. He has got a yeah. chance. I just don't expect him to be peaking. And I Djokovic has been here a million times. Um, okay, yeah. Moving on from that, the next match I was going to talk about was on Shabur v Elise Mertens. Um, did you catch any of that one? Uh, a few points. Um... I, I remember um, I switched over for like the last couple of points of the first set tiebreak, which I heard was epic, and Jabor finished it with a couple of massive forehands. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah that's that the main thing I was going to talk about. There was like four set points in there. Um, I think the, I actually um, Merrin's played a really brilliant match, and um, I, I, Vance was meant to be originally. I was going to test him in this one. He absolutely would have known this. Um, I'm sure you might be aware of it in some ways as well, but um, the, the streak of 18 consecutive further in appearances continued for Elise Mertens in uh, this Grand Slam like she's such a consistent player she'll always beat the player ranked below her in these events however only three quarter final appearances in that time it, she always gets unstuck by a player better than her and it, it wasn't really that clear in this match why because she played really really well it was literally just like a few points here or there Shabur I mean Shabur played so well in those set points she is actually incredible and 
I have a really, really, I mean, I, I, I'm almost certain she's going to get to the final. She was playing exceptionally well. She, the way she was like able to sort of dig out really low balls and set points without fear, using like forehand slices and stuff. It was, it was, it was a masterclass. I was actually in awe the whole time. And I, I mean, I think Jupiter is my favorite player to watch, to be honest. It's um, so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. that, that was clear why there, definitely. Yeah. And um, I mean, one of the top two favorites for the title at this point, right? Like she's got mm -hmm. all the variety in the world. Her peak on grass is astonishing. Mm -hmm. um, she's got a lot of momentum, having a great year. So yeah, I yeah, I, I feel like at this point, anything less than a runner-up performance um, would be a disappointment. And I mean that like mm -hmm. as a compliment towards yeah. her level. Like yeah, she's she's amazing. Yeah, definitely. Um... I'll get into the two players she'd be playing at. Well, certainly in the same as it would be Neymar or uh, Maria, which, I mean, that could have easily been a, a first round for her. Um, who's she playing in the quarters? I will just find out quickly. No, I can't see it. It'll come back to me. I'm not sure. But yeah, she, she, she's, a, she's a big favourite for that as well. So fingers crossed for Vision Brewer. Like, you know, I've always been a massive fan of her. A first Grand Slam final would be amazing, regardless of a title or not. So, um, Yeah, next one. This will probably be the last of the, the big matches to talk about. Then we'll talk about the quarters a wee bit. Sits past Kyrgios. Yeah, so this one I intentionally did not watch uh, because I was reading tweets about it and I decided I didn't really want to see that. Um, okay. But yeah, for so, I, I mean, I do know, like, you know, generally what happened. Just, like, listen to some analysis on it. Um, I don't really feel like we learned anything new about either guy. Um, yeah. I think... I think we knew Kyrgios was capable of this. I think we knew Tsitsipas' return was going to be a problem. He didn't mm -hmm. break surf. Um, yeah, like, I, I think we knew there was going to be a lot of abuse from Kyrgios' side. Um, and yeah, I mean, Tsitsipas occasionally getting dragged down to the level of the drama as well. Um, I mean, hitting a ball into the crowd out of anger when a point was live, um, I think is disappointing um okay, so i in steph's defense he was trying to hit chaos <laughs> oh no this was um I, I like so that that yeah whatever but like the there was one point where curios hit an underarm serve up no, no. he was and, trying uh, to, he was trying to hit chaos he, he said afterwards <laughs> off the underarm serve he, was, he, he missed went, by a mile it went into the crowd i know he, i know he missed well he, he, that's what he said eh, clearly. i know i know he, was, okay. he missed by a mile but that's what he said afterwards he did say he was trying to hit chaos which okay, makes more and, sense I, I mean, at, at, at the very least, if you're going to try to hit someone, which is a fair tactic, if you hit them, you win the point. Like, have better aim. Like, he, he tried to do it on an overhead volley, and he hit it long. Like, I, I don't care if you miss the player, but, like, get it between the lines if it's an easy ball. Like, you can't let that impact your chances to win. Oh, he... I mean, he was very, very clear afterwards. He let him... He did get rattled, and he, uh, yeah. he totally embraced it in some ways. It's, so I'm, I'm assuming everybody listening to the podcast will know already sort of what happened. It, it's, it's a it's a really interesting match to be honest for me because it is it's very difficult for me to have watched that match and say afterwards I don't I wouldn't want to see that again. Like I it it was it was crazy. It was dramatic. It was. I'm actually you know I will say just now, Kyrgios is not good for tennis. I think I think I'm, I'm I think I think I'm fine with saying that. But the match in isolation, if I didn't know who was playing, it was very, very fun to watch. Yeah, I, I mean, we can we can talk about this bit, if if you don't mind. I mean, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. I, I think the thing with Kyrgios is that, so, you know, casual fans, or maybe even non-tennis fans, got absorbed by that match. Like, that was a fact. People were talking about it. Um, my thing is, like, I in this case, I don't know if that's a good thing. Because a lot of people were entranced by the drama and the screaming and the fact that like they seem to hate each other I'm like mm -hmm. i don't know if that's what tennis is like tennis is a sport where people hit a ball back and forth and so i feel like you should try to get new fans by selling that and if you're selling a drama fest where with screaming and swearing and one player trying to hit the other one with the ball um i don't know you can get that in other places you know i don't mm -hmm. think that's the best part of tennis or a reliable part of tennis and i don't think it should be um so you know i'm I'm glad that people tuned in to tennis but i wasn't really happy about the reasons why yeah no i i, I definitely agree with that i think it, the, the way he was talking about it afterwards though it, he, if there was any thought that i should have been 
sort of maybe siding with Kyrgios, you know, when he was like talking about getting a default for Sitsipas and stuff, he totally erased those thoughts in the, the presser. He, he, he's got a way about him that's a little bit dangerous, I think. I don't know, he kind of speaks in ways that kind of shut down what other people are saying and, and kind of gaslighty ways almost. Yeah, I mean, he's straight up denying things that we saw happen. Um, yeah. He's exactly. like, the, the circus was all Tsitsipas, not true. Um, basically denied all wrongdoing whatsoever. BS. Um, and he consistently does this. Like, either he genuinely sees nothing wrong with the things he's doing, or he's gaslighting everyone. And I think, given what we know about him, and, you know, the screenshots his ex-girlfriend shared of, like, some of their messages, like, I think it's the gaslighting. Like, I think mm -hmm. he is trying to, like, talk people into thinking they didn't see what they actually did see um mm -hmm. which sucks like mm -hmm. i mean Definitely. like his game is great and i would love to want to watch and analyze his matches but he is yeah I, I i don't think he's great to have around a lot of the time um yeah mm -hmm. yeah I, and i'm pretty much exactly the same feeling one small point i wanted to um just sort of clarify for people Kyrgios was talking about getting Tsitsipas fined for hitting a ball into the crowd. The ATP rules basically say if you don't hit, well, <clears throat> if you don't actually hurt somebody, I guess, <clears throat> well, I'll tell you the exact rule, <clears throat> but what he did comes under the ball abuse offence and players are penalised in accordance with the point penalty schedule in that instance, basically. Kyrgios basically was, he, he cited Djokovic's default as, you know, reason for Tsitsipas to be defaulted in that instance that came under the where is it let me see um the physical abuse offense basically what in the ATP rule book and in that case the circumstances were so flagrant and particularly injurious to the success of the tournament ATP supervisors came to the conclusion it came under the major offense of aggravated behavior act basically and that's why he was defaulted it's quite complicated well it's not that complicated actually he essentially didn't hurt anybody egregiously yeah. i suppose and i just wanted to clarify that i mean it really doesn't matter it wasn't Kyrgios's decision to make he just yeah. needs to show up and accept yeah and, and it's, a, it's especially hard to take coming from Kyrgios, who you know hit a ball into the stands or bounced a ball into the stands at the australian open during doubles it did hit someone i think it was a kid who cried um and then he didn't get defaulted went on to win the tournament like I mean, he's he's such a hypocrite um, in in many many instances, um, and there just seems to be a total lack of self awareness on his mm -hmm. end, like which is annoying. Um, I mean, and and again, it's frustrating because like he's got a great game. Um, I think besides Nadal and Djokovic, he's probably the biggest factor left mm -hmm. on the men's side. Um, like. When he applies himself, he's very, very good. Um, but there's this, um, and that makes it a lot harder, sometimes impossible, to enjoy any of that. Did you see as well, um, he posted a video last night, sort of a six-hour conversation, I think, with, with two podcasters. I'm not sure who they were. Did you catch any of that? No, I didn't bother watching, did you? No, no, but did, yeah, just the fact that he posted, I suppose, and um, the fact that he was up for six hours last night making the video and clearly yeah. looked groggy when he played against Nakashima in the first... I, I mean, it's on brand for him. Um, yeah. Like, he... I mean, I, on average, he cares less than other players. You can't deny that. Like, he... The fact that he applies himself sometimes doesn't mean that he won't self-sabotage or tank when he feels like it. Um, but, you know, comes with the territory. This is not new information either. I would like to talk about the quarters, who's there, and maybe who we think is going to go forward and such. The first one being Cam Norrie v David Goldfan. I, I actually think Cam Norrie's been playing really well, and I, I think people keep forgetting there's a reason he's just outside the top 10. Like he, He's yeah. got a game that's incredibly difficult for anybody who's not playing a sort of top 10 level to, to counter. And, I mean, for that reason alone, I, you know, I could go into the matchup exactly, but for that reason alone, I don't expect Goldfan to be able to to pull off that level for for three sets, to be honest. It, it's an interesting one. I I kind of want to pick Goldfan, although I'm not totally sure why. I feel like, I mean, and this probably does a disservice to Nori, but I feel like Goldfan maybe has a higher peak level. Um, oh, he does. Like he, he, does. He, he has a mode where he can take the ball early. Um, 
and rush the other player that I don't think Nori has. Um, it's a tough one. I feel like it's such a great opportunity for them both. Um, yeah. I like. I guess my main prediction would be it'll be close. I can't imagine either player really running away with it. No, yeah, yeah. Um, four sets, I think, for Cam Noni. Okay, I'll go go Fan in four. Although he had that long match against Tiafo, so He might have recovered yeah. from that, to be yeah, fair. I'll, 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 I'll stick with it. Uh, go Fan in four. And actually, yeah, the fact he beat Ugo Humber as well, I mean, he's having a really good Wimbledon, so... It's not, yeah, it's not a bad prediction, Ona, and I'm really not saying four sets to Nori with any sort of confidence, but yeah, I just... I... I just feel like he, yeah, I, I feel like Cam's destiny is semi-finals and then beaten really easily by Djokovic, to be honest. Yeah, well, I, I mean, let's be honest. Whoever wins is going to get crunched. Um, yeah. I mean, do you remember that quarterfinal between Goffin and Djokovic in 2019? Um, Goffin, yes. um, he actually got a break yes. and he was up 4 3, 30 love in the first set and then lost, I think, 10 games in a row. Um, oh, really? <laughs> so so, yeah, so we'll, I, we'll get a, a drama free semi final, that much we know. Um, mm. <laughs> I guess the only question is who will be the victim? Yeah, geez, oh. uh, <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think that's fair, Owen. You're quite right. Um, yeah, so yeah, we've talked about Djokovic and Sinner, and we can move past that. The other half of the draw, Nadal v. Taylor Fritz. Any chance? It's an interesting one. I short answer to your question is no uh if nadal's fit um mm-hmm. should be fine um but i think fritz can make it interesting um mm-hmm. yeah, i think he's a bit better than bundesanschul at most things so he can mm-hmm. cause some issues i think if he comes out of the gates hot like he did in indian wells um you can jolt nadal a bit because he tends to be a slow starter sometimes um mm-hmm. but yeah i i can't imagine that nadal won't run away with it once he gets going mm-hmm yeah, I don't really see there being many matchup issues besides Fritz's sort of serving peak being pretty high. Yeah, that could steal a set, maybe two. But yeah, uh, I think I think Nadal's. Yeah, I think people do people underrate Nadal's hungriness, um, hunger even. Um, I think the fact he's won the first two slams of the the season, he'll do whatever he can to to get through that match and give himself a chance in the final. I mean, I don't see Kyrgios making a. Um, final but yeah in the semi-final sorry is what i meant to say um, weird to think about isn't it um yeah yeah i mean yeah it, it's funny with nadal like the calendar slams absolutely a thing but mm-hmm. i i mean and i think he probably is thinking about it but i think his general match-to-match hunger is always on like i think he'll it, like it's cliche at this point because everyone knows it but i think he will like fight for every match regardless of what it means um yeah so i feel like yeah, like no no worries whatsoever for me about him burning out because I don't know if it's ever happened before. Yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah, p- p- pretty easy decision there. And yeah, Kyrgios Garin. I I actually want to say Kyrgios is probably definitely going to win that. I don't I don't think <clears throat> I don't think there's no chance. But like the fact that Kyrgios can just sort of rattle through his service games, I like I see no reason that he couldn't just chip away at Garin's serve and get enough breaks quite easily. And you know, to come through the match, maybe even in straight sets. Yeah, I mean, on grass and probably overall as well, Kyrgios is a better player. Um, I think, I do think there's a chance that, like, in a, it's, it's not a low stakes match, but I feel like there's a chance that Gorin is an opponent who he sees as, like, beneath his interest level and mm-hmm. would, you know, play a, a board match and end up losing uh, by his own hand. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't see Gorin winning it on tennis. Um, I'll say that. Yeah, and yeah, I suppose that's worth mentioning. Like he could stay up incredibly late again, two nights in a row, whatever. I don't know. Totally rock up to the match. Like yeah, half cut, had a whatever. shoulder issue today. I think that yeah. could be a thing. I don't know. Yeah, and um, yes, yeah, so we're probably thinking Djokovic v Noni and Nadal v Kyrgios. Nothing that crazy there. On the women's side, start with yeah, Halepanis and Mova is going to be super interesting. I think. Yeah. So. I, th- this is probably the most intriguing one for me. Um, yeah. I mean, I watched Halep today, and it was just peak performance. Like, you know, Bedosa is fourth in the world, and she was not in this match for a second. Um, Halep both found a way to, like, not make unforced errors and constantly keep Bedosa on the run. Um, you know, it was reminiscent of what she did in the final against Serena three years ago. 
Um, so if she continues playing at this level, like, yeah, she can absolutely win. Mm-hmm. At the same time, I think Anisimova is a tough matchup for her. Like, I think the players who can beat Halep most easily are the ones who take her time away, attack all the time, um, mm-hmm. and just mm-hmm. generally hit heavier and faster. Um, that's Anisimova. Um, and so it's, since Halep doesn't really have that much easy power, Anisimova can play the match on her terms. Like, maybe she'll lose by making 50 on force errors, but if she's accurate enough, she could totally win. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I think I'll go with Halep. Um, she's mm-hmm. too good today. I, I actually am tempted to side with Anisimova in this one. I am in precess, probably. I mean, predictably, but <clears throat> like before the tournament, I expected Anisimova to be a little bit poor in return I think I thought our return was going to get rushed basically and maybe a bigger server might be able to take advantage of that I don't know if that's a match up thing because I well Coco Goff actually no that yeah she played Coco Goff of course and she should have been able to to stop and it's more sort of teeing off on her returns but she was still able to like I just think she's seen the ball really well this tournament and you're quite right if there was going to be somebody that beats out it's a big hitter and it's more one of the biggest hitters when she's playing well enough um yeah, I want to side with Anisimova. I just I think she's playing too well. It, it's I, totally fair. I mean, yeah. I, I think she is more easy power than anyone on tour. Like, I, I mean, I, I think back to the match she played against Osaka at the Australian Open, and she's, like, trading forehands with Osaka and, like, overpowering her. Like, that's amazing. Um, mm-hmm. You know, no one else can do that, really. Uh, so, yeah. Um, she could... I think she could even win in straights, conceivably, if... Yeah. Like, if the day is right. Um, Definitely. But, yeah, I have... Based on track record, I have more faith in Hella. So, yeah, fair. Um, yeah, Anisimova. I, I actually got to see her at Wimbledon a few days ago. I um, the the thing that struck me the most was her backhand. Like, it's impossible to read. It's like literally, like literally, can do anything with it. I just thought it looked yeah. amazing. So yeah, if she can return well on her backhand, um, she might have. A, I mean, she has it down the line well enough. It's not like it goes into how strength for anything. Like she can do whatever she likes with it. So yeah, and she's playing well enough. I mean, if you leave a ball hanging for a second against her, she hits a winner off of it. From yeah. the side. Like, and Halep, Halep does that a fair bit. Like, her her strength is not, like, rushing her opponents, really. Like, she's mm-hmm. she's offensive, but, like, she doesn't have all that much power, especially not compared to Anna Samova. So, mm-hmm. yeah, if Anna Samova's on, it, it could absolutely go her way. Definitely. Could be very one sided. But we'll, we'll see. We'll see. But, yeah, I'm, I'm going to go Anna Samova, definitely. Okay. And the other one, Ribikina versus Tom Milanovic. Um, yeah, I want to say, but I've said this to you already, but um, I've I've been going on about Ribikina for a long time. I think this yeah. is her time. I've just been waiting for the for it to happen. I put one pound on her before the tournament. If she wins, one hundred and fifty pounds back. I thought I thought that was the best odds I've ever got in my life. I mean, she's an amazing player, and I I genuinely thought she looked like she had more of a chance at the start of the tournament than Shvontek. That's all I'll say. I don't know if she'll win wow. it. There. But um, before the yeah. tournament, bold. Well, I I've got it on writing at least, so I can I can sort of prove it. I guess. Yeah, yeah, no, it's. I mean, I I don't doubt that you said that. I I yeah. would not have said that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I I think I will pick Rabakina. I mean, I honestly haven't really seen her or Tomoyanovich play much this tournament, but I heard that Tomoyanovich had a really tiring match today um, mm-hmm. against Corne. Corne, yeah, it was um, Corne. Yeah. So so yeah. Um, that that's my pick on that one. Yeah, I, I just uh, serving forehand combo is actually unbeatable when it's on, and then a grass court really should be amazing. So I, I just yeah, I think Tom Ivanovic has got pretty similar strengths to Rubikina to be honest, and Rubikina's are are just a little bit more loading firepower. So if Rubikina's playing well enough, she should win that one. Yeah, I, I imagine she'd have an edge in the serve return battle at least. Yeah, definitely. Um, looking at the other side, if I can jog my memory, I don't have it in front of me. Neymar and Maria is one of the. We've talked about that. We said um, Neymar probably will get through. Um, Maria could be a disruptor of rhythm, though, possibly. And then the other one, if you can remember it, I might have to look it up quickly. Owen. Yeah, I, I, I've got it pulled up here. I'll just. Uh, Buskova. Um, Buskova. I've totally forgot about Buskova. She, yeah. She's another one I wasn't following at all. Yeah, I'll I'll go with Jabor on that one. She's got a ton of momentum and playing great. So, Buskova's hit, yeah, Buskova's beat a, a, a few pretty good players so far. To be fair, um, yeah, I mean she like beat Garcia pretty handily. Um, yes. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, be, yeah, beat Risk easily before that. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I mean that well, that could go either way as well, honestly, because well. She's, she, 
I, I just yeah, I wanted to give Buscovan more of a chance, but I would I would still sit I would still side with Jabur definitely. I, I, I think I, I agree. Yeah, <clears throat> Jabur's got that like after saving those four set points and after the match in general, she's just got that air about her. Like in Rome, I just I like I I love using this as a as a, an example. In Rome, she made the final there on pure confidence alone. I mean, I, well, and a little bit of help from Sakari, of course, in her quarter final. Um, but. Like overall, there was just confidence stripping out of her. Basically, I mean, she she played the ball like I mean, she didn't really look like she had the level to make the final there, in my opinion. But just played every match as confidently as she could and got to the final on confidence alone. I feel like she's suited to Wimbledon and she's confident. I just feel like there's no way she loses against Buzkova and there's no way she loses against Maria Nightmare as well. Yeah, I mean, I think she's a a great pick to make the final at least. Um, and it feels like. The quarterfinal and whoever she gets in the semi are going to be on her racket for sure. And maybe the final as well, depending on who her opponent is. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it does feel like her winning a major is kind of inevitable at this point. Like, if not here, it, it'll happen soon. She's playing way too well. Yeah, she's got such a, a good peak, exactly. You're quite right. And she just plays, she brings that level as well to every match. So, yeah, I think it'll happen eventually. Oh, and fingers crossed. <laughs> Yeah, I, so, I mean, this is in danger of starting another long segment, but I, and it's Nadal. still a long way off, but thoughts on a potential nadal Djokovic final? Um, well, the chances of it, sorry, are the actual... The, like, the, the dynamics, if it were to happen. Yeah, oh my god, it would be amazing. Um, yeah, I would absolutely kill for it, of course. It's what yeah. I live for, basically, as an analyst. Um, Djokovic, Nadal is one of the most fascinating rivalries of all time. Grass is a little bit of a leveler as well, actually. So um, it, it, I actually would struggle to pick a, a winner. Well, I'd still side with Djokovic, but I, I um, yeah, I mean, it's way closer than it would be in Australia, for example, definitely. Yeah. Um, oh, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be so good. The two, I'll need to rewatch the 2018 match just for a little bit oh, of a... Uh, you, you should rewatch that one just for fun, like aside yeah. from analysis, because it's, it's a gem. Um, um, yeah, no, no, I, I, I think... Um, no, well, I'll get properly into dynamics if it does happen. I, I would just say I think Djokovic is probably the, the the winner in that match by an absolute whisker. Not quite 2018, I think four sets or something like that, probably. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I mean, I, there's a lot of stuff that happens in Australia, like the sort of forehand to backhand dynamic isn't quite the same um, because Djokovic can't take it from his sort of preferred contact point. But there's other stuff that he does better than the Dow, certainly able to keep it lower. Um, yeah. more consistently than Nadal, for example. Better server in general, obviously. By, by um, far at Wimbledon as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, which will just give him a few more easy service points. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, loads of reasons why I think Djokovic would be the favourite, but it, yeah. it, it should, be, should be really close. Yeah, Are you excited for it? Oh God, I, I can't even tell you. Um, I, I was thinking about stuff I was going to write about it today, and it's not even like... <laughs> happening yet i, I think uh -huh. the thing i'm most interested to see is kind of aside from tactics um like so yeah djokovic is a favorite but i think if this match happens it's kind of ruthlessly going to expose is he back or not um because i think their match at roland garros like i don't want to say he didn't show up but he was not at his best um mm -hmm. and i think if he's not at his best here either he probably can't win um and so i think like and you know it's not that time is running out exactly, but he's missing chances. He's taking chances away from himself. He needs to win this tournament. Um, and so I think if there's the slightest thing off with him, we'll be able to see it in that final. Um, yeah. And if he's at his best, then there's going to be a sense of like, okay, he's Djokovic is still here. Um, but I do feel like that match is going to be like a, a reckoning of sorts for him. Yeah, I mean... I would never say pressure would affect Djokovic, but obviously the US Open final last year showed that that's not always the case. So, you know, if he was feeling any pressure, that this is what well, is his only chance to win a slam this year, um, yeah. then, you know, it might, it might show and it, it might make a big difference. And certainly Nadal, pff, the best guy in the world at taking advantage of that. So, yeah. There's other also no pressure on Nadal whatsoever because he's not supposed to win this match. So That's true. Yeah, exactly. That's true. Obviously, he'd love to win it, though. I suppose he's in a similar situation to Djokovic last year in some ways. But yeah, you're, yeah. you're, you're right. I think there would actually be more pressure on Djokovic uh, should that matchup happen. That's so exciting. Fingers it's crossed. Really, it's really, really exciting. I don't know if I'd be able to blag my way to say the court again, but Jesus Christ. I'd... Oh, my God. Imagine being there for Wimbledon's <laughs> final between those two. 
<laughs> yeah, I'm um, I'm still I'm still not over the fact that you saw them at the French Open, honestly, on my lads. I, I I'll tell you, like, I still think about that match every day. Like last year when they played at the French, I thought about that match every day until this year's right. match. Like yeah, their their matches are just different from all other matches. Um, which is why I gotta see it again and again. Like mm-hmm. sixty. They could get to sixty matches. That's it's crazy. It's so actually crazy. And um, we'll wrap up there. Thanks very much, Owen, for, for joining me. It's been a brilliant episode. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Hopefully, we might catch you later in the week. We'll see. You're not totally committed to that. You don't have to be, but um, I, I probably will ask you later in the week. So, fingers crossed. Might see Vance as well. Yeah. Um, depends what happens. I'm sure if there was a Nadal Djokovic final, you'd be ready to talk about it. So, um, yes. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, thanks very much for listening this far through, guys. If you want to catch any of Owen's work, yeah, go to his Twitter. You can follow him at Tennis Nation. If you want to follow me on Twitter, you can go to on the line underscore Jack, or you can go to on the uk. Thank you very much. Please catch us next time on the Online Tennis Podcast. Thank you.